uh, live with Dr. McDougall today. And this is the weekly webinars that we do. Uh, today I'm in London, so um, we might have a few little bumps in the road, but hopefully everything will work okay. Um, I will pass it on to Dr. McDougall and welcome you and thank you for being uh, in California and, uh, and uh, talking to all of us today as you do every week. Welcome, uh -huh. Dr. McDougall. Thank you. I'm really happy to be in California. You know, Europe uh, seems to be a pretty exciting place this uh, this time. In fact, next week you go to Paris, and I can only imagine what things are going to be. I do. Like. Yeah, I can only imagine what things are going to be like there. Well, uh, what I, I uh, am going to talk about today is we're going to just continue some of the discussion we had last week on diabetes, and uh, I put together some uh, some uh, slides, so to speak to cover some of the material that we talked about last week and also to add some of the things that uh, we were talking about last week. First thing I wanna make clear is, uh, unless I say otherwise, I'm talking about type two diabetes, the kind of diabetes where patients make their own insulin. I'm not talking about type one diabetes unless I specifically say so. A type one diabetic uh, must be on insulin or they will not live. So uh, this discussion is about type two diabetes. I prepared a few uh, slides to go through. I'm going to go through them quickly, but as I understand it, uh, I know you can watch uh, this uh, same presentation over and over again uh, from my website. And so uh, you can catch, catch the references, you can uh, look at the slides more clearly and so on. Uh, I did uh, in the year 2011, a, a, uh, a lecture, uh, about an hour long lecture titled Diet, drugs and diabetes, 100 years of missed opportunities. And you can play that video from my website free. Just go to the education section, then go under videos, then go under free videos, and you'll find this particular uh, lecture. And I know you'll enjoy it a lot. I had uh, a lot of, I presented it to a few medical groups. And, you know, as usual, uh, I don't find people uh, coming back to me and saying, uh, you misquoted the literature, you exaggerated, it's not true, it's true. Uh, a uh, fellow by the name of Huckaday wrote, it is important to remember that diabetic control means a lot more than blood sugar control. You see, uh, what di doctors try and do worldwide is they just try and make the blood sugar look more normal. And uh, medication effectively lowers the blood sugar levels, but the patients die sooner with better looking numbers. That's, that's all they accomplished. You get approved as a diabetic drug, all you have to be able to do is lower the numbers. You're not required to have better outcomes in terms of death and disease in terms of your patients. You just have to make the numbers lower. Uh, one of the first drugs I was dealing with when I was a young student 40 years ago was a uh, class of drugs called sulfonylureas. And back then uh, they reported that these drugs uh, uh, over a five to eight period, uh, five to eight year period of time increased the risk of death of diabetics by two and a half times. And that was published in the PDR. This is a section out of the physician's desk reference, uh, which is a, a special warning for increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And it appears next to every one of the diabetic drugs. We've known that these drugs kill, and we've known it since the 60s. Uh, what uh, doctors base control on now is not just the blood sugar numbers, they use a uh, a measurement of a protein, hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C. Uh, what this is is a normal hemoglobin protein in the body, and when sugars get attached to it, it distorts the protein. And for me, back when I first learned, learned about hemoglobin A1C, it seemed like an explanation, a good explanation, as to why diabetics do poorly. Their proteins are all distorted by having sugars attached to them. And I think that is true. I think that's one of the reasons that diabetics are metabolically handicapped. They're weakened people. Uh, they can't defend and repair as well as other people. They get a sore on their foot. They could get gangrene easily. They lose their vision. They lose their kidneys because their proteins are all distorted. But what doctors logically thought is if we lower the blood sugars by giving medications, that the problems would be fixed. The distortions of the uh, hemoglobin A1C or the hemoglobin, <clears throat> which is the hemoglobin A1C would be fixed and everything would be fine. But that's not what has happened. 
Uh, I want to go through six major studies with you on the aggressive treatment of type 2 diabetes. You can look these up later if you want, but these are all the studies that are available on treating type 2 diabetes. Uh, the studies were set up so that one group was treated casually. In other words, they got usual diabetic care, checked their blood sugar once in a while, maybe took a pill here or there. And the other group was, uh, was treated intensively. In uh, the first veteran study, they found a strong tendency toward worsening of cardiovascular outcomes in patients with intensive control. <clears throat> the uh, TRACE study, one of the biggest studies ever done, it was done in Europe. Uh, diabetic patients treated with oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin, but not those treated with diet alone, have a significantly increased mortality following acute myocardial infarction compared to non-diabetic patients. So this is the year 2000, 15 years ago. Uh, doctors, scientists, this is without, without any, any questioning. There's, there's uh, no one questions this data, and there's nothing else to say otherwise. Uh, the ACCORD study was actually stopped 17 months early by the uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute because they saw such a great increase in mortality in the patients that were treated intensively. Intensive treatment was to try and get the hemoglobin A1C uh, percentage level down to around 6% compared to the control group, which had a hemoglobin A1C level around 75 to 8.5%. So it was so poor that they had to stop the study early because they're they killing so many people with intensive therapy. And that was published in 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The uh, next study that followed was the advanced study, and they found there was no significant effects of the type of glucose control on major cardiovascular events death from cardiovascular disease or death from any cause. And then we have the veteran studies which showed intensive control. No significant effects on rates of major cardiovascular events, death, or microvascular complications with the exception of protein in the urine. So three major studies that were published in 2008 showed that all the aggressive therapy that your doctors are doing to try and make your blood sugar look better and your hemoglobin A1C look better results in a worse outcome for the patient. They have more death, more heart attacks, more sudden deaths, more hypoglycemia. They have uh, greater weight gains. It's a complete, a complete disaster what's going on and nobody responds to it in a professional, proper, honest way to help the patients. There's just too much money involved. Uh, for a drug to be improved, I told, approved to be used, it just has to lower blood sugar. In uh, 2008, the FDA asked the drug companies to be a little bit more professional and show there was an improvement in the health of the patients, but it was just a request. So drug management, higher mortality, more heart disease, increased risk of sudden death, much more hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, you could get picked up uh, by the police for a DUI if you get low blood sugar or fall over, and twice the weight gain in the intensive treated groups. So why do doctors justify still treating patients when we, when we know that they cause heart attacks and deaths and so on? How do they justify treating patients intensively with drugs? Well, they say maybe it doesn't help, help major vascular problems like heart attacks and strokes, but they say it helps minor vascular problems or my, little microvascular problems. These are the tiny blood vessels that go to the eyes and the kidneys and the nerves. This is the retina of the eye. You see the, the round, red, orange circle there? And that's what the back of your eye looks like, and that's the retina. And what they say is by using intensive treatment with various medications and insulin, they'll prevent hemorrhages and exudates and blindness. Uh, here's a review of the studies that have looked at whether or not intensive control with medication reduces microvascular complications. And you can later take and study this uh, chart more carefully, but I'll tell you what I see is that there's very little benefit when it comes to type two diabetes. When it comes to type one, there may be some benefit. It is really a lot less than your doctors brag about. There is some benefit in controlling kidney loss and eye loss, vision loss, and developing diabetic retinopathy, but it's not much. And when you look at the uh, patients with uh, type 2 diabetes, the studies that were done, like the ADVANCE and the ACCORD and the VETERANS study, what they show is not much, 
the advanced study and the veteran study maybe showed a little bit of benefit in terms of protein in the urine. Uh, it is surprising if you go through these research papers to see how little is accomplished. <clears throat> a uh, review of the treatment of microvascular uh, diabetes for microvascular outcomes uh, came to the conclusion intensive therapy did not reduce the risk of advanced measures of microvascular outcomes. That was in The Lancet in 2010. And uh, the Lancet published, uh, they, they published about, this was about the Accord study, Microvas microvascular benefits of intensive therapy should be weighed against the increase in total and cardiovascular disease related mortality, increased weight gain and a high risk for severe hypoglycemia. So the, the questions are being asked by some of the scientists, but the practice continues. Uh, the uh, British Medical Journal, <clears throat> their conclusion, the harm associated with severe hypoglycemia might counterbalance the potential benefit of intensive glu glucose lowering treatment. Intensive treatment was associated with a significant reduction in only one endpoint, the rate of microalbuminuria, which is the amount of protein in the urine. The gist of what you should be getting is all this effort provided by your doctors, all this medication you're buying, all of this uh, belief that you have, it's not true. It's not helping you. The research says so. The benefits are so, min are so minimal and the harms are so great. You ought to reconsider. Uh, I talked to you last week. I showed you some uh, papers. Uh, let me show them, them to you again, how sugar makes diabetes better and fat paralyzes insulin. This will, this is, will briefly go over the things we talked about last week. I talked about uh, Shirley Sweeney taking care of his medical students. He put them on a high sugar diet. Look at the sugars he put them on. Sugar, candy, pastry, white bread, baked potatoes, syrup, bananas, rice, oatmeal. And he checked their blood sugars after this uh, challenge meal and their blood sugars uh, responded normally. No, no evidence of diabetes. Uh, he did it with a high protein diet and the uh, blood sugars were higher on the high, high protein diet. So protein does, uh, it does uh, increase diabetes. And then he did it on a high fat diet and all of his medical students became profoundly diabetic right after the high fat meal and the fat was, fat was olive oil, butter, mayonnaise. Yeah, right, here's one of the students, just they took one student, they put them either, you know, on a high fat diet or high carbohydrate diet and you see the difference in ranges in blood sugars. On the high fat diet, they were diabetic on the high carbohydrate, high sugar diet, they were non-diabetic. This is Shirley Sweeney's basic work in 1927. Uh, I also talked to you about how uh, increasing the sugar intake, this was done by Brunzel, New England Journal of Medicine, 1971, increasing sugar intake actually made insulin work better. They had a synthetic, synthetic mixture of uh, uh, sugars, multidextrans, uh, simpler sugars of 45% of the calories. They doubled, doubled it to 85% of the calories and the fasting blood sugar level fell. Uh, the overall glucose tolerance improved. The fasting insulin was lower on the high sugar diet. Sugar makes insulin work more efficiently. As they say, it, these data suggest that a high carbohydrate diet increased sensitivity of peripheral tissues to insulin. Uh, I talked to you a little bit about uh, Hemsworth work that was published in 1940. Again, showing over and over that high fat diets paralyze insulin, create diabetes. High carbohydrate diets, even high sugar diets, do the opposite. The research is there. There's no controversy. Uh, here's uh, some more Bren, uh, of uh, Brunzel's work looking at insulin levels on the right hand side. You see on the high carbohydrate diet, there's less insulin produced because there's less insulin needed. All right, let's see. We also talked uh, last week about ongoing research. They took type 1 diabetics and uh, added fat to their diet. The result was the fat increased glucose levels and insulin requirements for type one diabetics. So it, it's consistent, it's clear, it's been published over you know, almost, almost 100 years now that sugar, even white sugar, makes diabetics better and fat paralyzes insulin and makes diabetics worse. And also think about something else. When I'm talking about sugar, I'm talking about carbohydrates like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils. These are the things that reduce the risk of kidney disease and heart attacks and strokes and keep you thin and give you good bowel movements. 
Well, we talked about fat paralyzing insulin. It doesn't just do that. Fat impairs your circulation and promotes cancer. I mean, the message is clear and consistent, but <laughs> the message to the patient is the exact opposite. And as a result, people are suffering terribly and unnecessarily. Uh, treating type two diabetes with a high carbohydrate diet. We got a clue to that during the war years uh, in England and Wales. They looked at the mortality rate for type two diabetes. And uh, prior to World War I, uh, mortality rate was increasing. The World War I came about between 1915 to 1918. And because of rationing, in other words, you couldn't eat all the butter and the eggs and the bacon, uh, the mortality rate decreased dramatically. Post World War I years, the economy returned till we get to World War II when rationing was uh, again uh, part of Western Europe's daily life. And as a result, incidence of uh, diseases like heart disease, and multiple sclerosis, and diabetes, and death from these diseases plummeted when people had to switch to potatoes and other vegetables as opposed to the meat and the butter and the cheese and so on. <clears throat> as an interesting guy I want to tell you about, his name's Rabinovich. He went around treating patients, thousands of patients all over uh, North America. And he said in his, one of his papers, I may I, however, observe that we now have over 500 patients on this diet and that 16 failures among them is, at least in my opinion, a highly satisfactory state of affairs. He concluded back in 1930 that his patients would rather eat a healthy diet, a high carbohydrate diet, than shoot themselves with insulin. What a conclusion. Uh, he said things like a potential, a potential diabetic can be transformed into a completely diabetic individual merely by administering of the time-honored carbohydrate-free diet of meat and fat. That's what he said in his paper. Fat protein diets from which carbohydrates are excluded find no logical place in the present management of a diabetic. The diets are sufficiently attractive so that when given the op op option of being sufficiently underweight, or taking insulin, the majority of patients selected the former course. 1930, Pritikin's results published in 2005. These are on about 4,000 patients. Uh, many of them were diabetic, and the results are their blood sugars dropped by about uh, 35 points. Uh, most of the people, people got off of uh, their oral agents, and many patients were able to stop and reduce their insulin. James Anderson, University of Kentucky, showed that uh, 10 of the 20 patients who were on insulin who had type 2 diabetes were able to get off the, uh, off the insulin completely. He got almost everybody off of diabetic medications. Uh, that was uh, University of Kentucky. James Anderson published that. Neil Bernard is publishing data these days uh, from PCRM. That's where Neil is located and showing that diabetics uh, do much, much better when they eat a vegan diet in the American Diabetic Association diet. The vegan diet happened to be the diet that I teach. And he's also recently published results on uh, helping people with peripheral neuropathy, in other words, pain in their legs and feet. Walter Kempner, <clears throat> back uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, he published results on treating type two diabetics. He fed them a diet that was 93% sugar 93% carbohydrate, and it got the same results. Patients uh, with type 2 diabetes were all cured, and uh, patients were benefited greatly. Uh, here's one of his, uh, his uh, patients. If you look on the left-hand frame, you see these white areas. Those are exudates. dates. If you see these red flared areas in the back of the eye, this is the retina. I showed you the retina of the eye a few slides ago. If you see the... Uh, the uh, red flares, those are aneurysms and bleeding in the eye. Put them on the Kempner diet, which is a very high carbohydrate diet, and you see the results of the same man's eye. About uh, two years later, you see the exudates that have disappeared, the hemorrhages have disappeared, the aneurysms have disappeared. And the way we treat this condition today is with laser therapy, which destroys the retina. All right, well, we are getting, uh, we are getting no more slides. I guess that's enough. I guess the slide presentation is done. All right. That's very good. Okay. Dr. McDougall, yes, you are you are on the on, on camera because I have turned off my due to the okay. quality. But I think that everybody in this uh, webinar along with me is wondering 
you have presented amazing, absolutely incredible, amazing scientific and research true. that really, it, and it's true, and it has That's no controversy. True. I mean, it, but but now, what is it? What's what is it going to take for the medical uh, <laughs> profession to start looking at this and doing something? What's going on? I, I don't. I don't know. It's the same thing with coronary artery bypass surgery for people who have chronic coronary artery disease. They just they're just making money. That's the, that's the only explanation. It's, they're just making money. They, they learned they learned a trade. They learned how to cut somebody's chest open and make fifty, you know, make five hundred thousand dollars a year doing it. And they're not willing to do anything else. Same thing with the MS drugs. It costs seventy five thousand dollars to uh, for just for the medication for a multiple sclerosis patient, and the drugs don't work. And they hurt people. Uh, you know, this is criminal behavior, but somehow or another, uh, no one has stepped up because they're all making too much money. That's why they aren't stepping up. <laughs> it's just so much money being made. Why would they do anything about it? But uh, anyway, I know, but we're dealing with people's lives. I mean, it's, yeah, I it's just unbelievable. Oh, well, my you know, God. You know, that's, that's why, Gustavo, they, uh, they cheat and uh, make fake computer, uh, computer wear for... Uh, to, to measure to measure the pollutants given given out of Volkswagen diesel engines, and that's why they make airbags that kill 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 people, because you know it's cheaper to cheat. You make more money cheating. <laughs> that's why it's just human beings. <laughs> yeah. Human beings. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. the. There's no, there's no other explanation. It's just the money. It's the, yeah, they, really. they act. Of, and I'm not going to say that uh, you and I are of a special grade above, above other people. It's just that's the way people act. Uh, they want to make money, you know, if a few people get hurt along the way, so be it. Uh, but there's billions and billions and billions of dollars being made cheating. And lying. Right, right. Dr. McDougall, would you just take a few questions? Yeah, uh, we them. won't have a lot of time today, um, but maybe just, a, I don't know, four or five questions. Would that be okay? Uh, so let's do that. I, I, uh, I, I want to make sure that you remember that all the things that I talked about in those few slides and much more is in a video that I did that's on my website, drmcdougall.com. Just look under education videos and uh, uh, there are free, free lectures and you'll find it down there. Uh, Drugs, diet, and diabetes, 100 years of missed opportunity is what it's called. And you can, you can uh, look at the uh, video. You can go look all all the scientific papers. You can go to your special friends and doctors and scientist people and say, why is this wrong? So, what, 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 what am I missing? What, show me the other side of the story. <laughs> you know, that's, I always have fun with that. Show me the right, other side of the story. Right, yeah. They don't want to talk about it. Um, so no, no, they just don't. And they, they, they ignore it, obviously. They would have to, they would have to give up a lot. <laughs> this is your mother. This is your dad. This is your grandfather. This right. is your children that are dying and suffering because of uh, this misinformation. Well, there is someone here on the call, just like you were saying, who has an 18-year-old son. And so, of course, this is very personal, very important. And she has a question um, that she says that her son has been diagnosed with um, insulin-resistant diabetes, and he's 18 years old. And if it's okay for him to eat brown rice and potatoes and pasta and bread, well, what do you say to that? Well, this is what we call type 1 diabetes, I assume. Uh, type 1, he's missing, he's missing pancreatic function, and it's not going to come back, and so he has to supplement with insulin. Uh, is it okay if he eats the foods I recommend? It's life-saving. It'll keep him from having complications of the kidneys and the eyes. Uh, I mean, the Western diet of, of meat and dairy and poultry and so on, I mean, it causes eye damage and heart damage and kidney damage in people without diabetes. You take somebody that's metabolically handicapped, like someone who has type 1 diabetes, and they just fall apart at a rampant rate. Within 11 to 17 years after the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, almost all of the patients have major complications. So you can prevent those complications, even if he has lost his pancreas, by feeding him the kind of diet I recommend. You can stop the eye damage. You can stop the kidney damage. You can uh, give him a chance of living to be a ripe old age. I've seen it before. I've seen only a few patients who have been treated with a high carbohydrate diet who are type 1 diabetic and I remember these people as being in their 40s with not a sign of diabetes complications you know of course they have the missing pancreas yeah absolutely why not why not I mean, why why would you feed dangerous hamburgers to somebody who's sensitive as your son is right or, right. or the meat eaters, uh, meat eaters pizza <laughs> or the 
cheese lovers pizza. Why would you feed him that? <laughs> it kills him. It's poison. It yes, yeah, it kills, exactly. Gives half of the American um, free diabetes. Dr. McDougall, um, someone is asking, Bernadette is asking that you last week you mentioned how you stop all med meds with type diabetes the first day of uh, your 10 day program if the patient has a good pancreas. So, what kind of test do, do you? You know, this is a, this is a, ju sure. this is a judgment thing. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for 40 years. And uh, the, some of the things I use to guess whether or not the patient is making sufficient insulin so that I can sa safe, safely stop their insulin, which could be as much as 300 units of insulin a day or 150 uh, and a half a dozen diabetic pills. Uh, I talk to the patients, and as I say, it's, 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 it's guesswork, it's judgment. If somebody is very overweight and they're uh, on multiple medications and they tell me they're clearly a type 2 diabetic and that they've never gone into ketoacidosis and uh, uh, sometimes their blood sugars get quite low, they have frequent hypoglycemic reactions, I know they're taking too much medication. And because I only have them at my program for 10 days, I've got to move fast. And so if my guess is that they're really a type 2 diabetic or at least a strong type 1 and a half diabetic, I still stop all your medication because if I don't, they'll have hypoglycemic reactions and they'll fall down on the floor. And somebody's going to come to me and say, well, why did you keep, keep them on those medications? They had hypoglycemia and got in their car and drive, drove into somebody and killed them. You know, I, I've got to move fast. So what I do is I take them off all their medications first day. <clears throat> If I believe that they make sufficient insulin, and then I follow them every morning. I just check their blood sugars in the morning, and I hope their blood sugar is, uh, well, if they're off medication, it can be as low as, as, as it wants to be. But uh, you know, I hope their, their, their blood sugar usually is it's about 150 to maybe 300 if they're a type 1 and a half diabetic. If they're truly a type 2 diabetic, after a few days, they, they're, they're coming down to around 100, and after they lose all that fat, 100% of the time, a type 2 diabetic will be cured of their type 2 diabetes. Right. Uh, could you tell us, Dr. Magdala, one more time in a little more detail how to find that video so that people can, right. by going to your Go website? website you go under education, and then under education, there's a section called videos, and um, uh, then there's a, site, a section called free videos, and I think it's the third video down. Or you could just look up, go, go to the search engine, just look up diet, or diet, comma, drugs, comma, and diabetes. That'll do it. 100 years of, wa uh, 100 years of wasted opportunity or missed opportunities. Uh, shouldn't have any problem finding the video. Right. And it's Very free. Good. Like everything on the website, it's free, except your trip to Hawaii with us, which we are going to be talking for, which is January 30th, by the way. So we'd... Love to have see more people come along with us to Hawaii. And I think we have another 10-day program coming up in December. You'll see that on the website, too. And there, if you come, I will help you personally uh, make these changes and guide you through the diabetic uh, process of getting off your medication, if possible. Remember, some people have to take insulin. And I usually give long-acting insulin called Lantus. And I always give uh, insulin to type 1 diabetics and to type 2 diabetics. I give them a little bit of Lantus so they don't lose too much weight develop symptoms of diabetes such as excessive urination and or if they worry about the numbers, I'll give them some Lantus to poke themselves with so that mother-in-law doesn't worry, doctor doesn't worry, they don't worry. Right. See, we're doing, we're, we're doing medicine, we're shooting ourselves and our blood sugar is a little bit lower. So I, I, I'm a full-fledged doctor. I take care of all parts of the body, including the mind, and I don't want them to get worried. So I give it then too. Right. But I never give um, pills. The pills are dangerous. So you go. You prefer the insulin over the pills. Yeah, because that shows, shows you the sulfonylureas. Uh, we know since 1970 that they increase the risk of dying of heart disease by two and a half times over a five to eight year period of time. The other drugs are associated with uh, with heart failure, all kinds of problems. These medications are, and people say, well, what about uh, glucophage or metformin? Well, that has fewer complications. But huh, you know, most of the patients I have on metformin, they've got gastrointestinal distress, and who knows what other problems they'll develop. If you want to read about the side effects of metformin, just go to the internet. Way too many side effects. Benefits, pretty oh, close yes. to zero. <laughs> I know. It's, Except it's the blood sugar looks a little lower. 
You know, it, right. the, the benefit is the blood sugar looks, looks a little lower. The doctor thinks he or she is doing something for the patient. The patient thinks he or she is doing something for herself. But the truth of the matter is the benefits from metformin are minimal and questionable. Uh, they, you know, they pre uh, presented some minimal benefits from this drug, but certainly not comparable to eating a potato. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> why, why? I mean, why eat potatoes? They're free. <laughs> why not take pills? <laughs> People are getting rich. Right. Well, Nobody's getting rich eating potatoes, right? And by the way, potatoes are great for diabetics. I know you've been told otherwise. <laughs> exactly. Yes, actually, we had, I, I had someone submit a question about that, saying that the doc, a doctor told her that eating sweet potatoes was good, but not potatoes. No, well, that's not true. There's, there's so, little, true. so little physicians and dietitians know that it is true and effective. They get little tidbits of misinformation. Uh, they go to uh, they go to meetings that are paid for by Kraft and and uh, the dairy industry and the meat industry. They put up all the booths and bring in all the speakers. And I want to tell you, the only speakers that get to speak at these meetings are those that promote their products. They never invite me. Huh. <laughs> you, you mean you don't get invited? I get no invitation. I get so lonely. You know, uh, it's it's just uh, it's it's criminal. It is absolutely criminal when people it really is when yeah. people take your money and hurt you. It's criminal. They're called criminals. Criminals. Well, well, <laughs> yes. Say. I mean, but they're nice. You are criminals. hurting. They're nice. Yes. Yeah, they they're you know, like your next door neighbor and your cousin and your. I mean, they don't think they're doing anything wrong, but they're criminals. They have nice cars and nice yeah, houses, nice so cars. they're. Yeah. They go to church, right. you know, everything's, everything's fine, but they're hurting people and they know it. They have an inkling that they know it. They know there's something wrong. I mean, none of the patients ever get better. Right, and they don't get they better. Complications all the time. You know, 20% at least of the hospital admissions are due to medications that people take. People, we all know this, but uh, we don't have the will to act to do the right thing somehow or other, I don't know. Oh, well, it is disappointing in some way, but well, that's why we're doing this webinar. The, the same story Gustavo has told for the treatment of chronic coronary artery disease with catheterization. The same. Yeah. same story. Same Just story. as much money to uh, treating multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid and other inflammatory arthritis. Uh, these uh, arthritides, arthritides, correct word. Uh, treating, uh, treating these people with these uh, powerful, expensive biologics uh, that uh, increase the risk of, risk of death and all kinds of complications cost uh, $35,000, $45,000 a year. You know, uh, this is, uh, again, criminal behavior. The multiple sclerosis people, same thing. Uh, I, ha I have no kind words for your actions. You're nice no. people, but your actions are evil. Right. Yeah. There you go. Mm. There, there right. I go again. There I go again. I, just, I got you started. <laughs> well, uh, let's let's go ahead and Dr. Mandu, we're going to take, take one more question and then finish for today, um, if you don't mind. That's fine. Okay. Uh, what some, uh, Julie asked, what do you think of glycemic index of foods? Uh, it is uh, an interesting quality of food that misleads people into taking actions that are incorrect. For example, the glycemic index of a Snickers bar is 67%. The glycemic index of, uh, of uh, bread is 119%. So you would say, obviously, Snicker bars are better than bread. You know, it's just one quality. When you eat, your blood sugar is supposed to go up. It's supposed to go up. There are other qualities of food. There's the fiber content, the protein content, the vitamins, the minerals, and so on. Uh, there are all kinds of qualities of food, but people have latched on a glycemic index. This index was invented by, uh, by David Jenkins, who has been a friend of mine for 30 years. And I, I believe, I have to say this, and if David hears this, uh, I apologize for him um, taking any offense, but I still think David Jenkins is confused about what he developed. And he is, does not understand uh, uh, its proper use, or at least he's not communicated to the public or uh, that I have heard uh, that the glycemic index is uh, something that should not guide the choice of foods. Uh, there are, it should be considered, but it should not be the uh, above all guide. And David and I are friends, and he may take this nice or not nice, but that's what I feel about it. <clears throat> Well, but uh, doesn't it matter that we don't eat isolated foods, that we 
combined foods and that makes a difference in the glycemic index or that's not true? Well, uh, it, yes, it, it, absolutely what you said is true. Uh, if you combine one glycemic index food with another one, so you take Snicker bars and Babe Ruth bars and uh, fructose syrup, and yeah, you can combine all of those together and you'll get a, a different percentage. What is important is that you know that the right foods are starches, vegetables, and fruits, period. And what other, you know, if you want to say that uh, they're white, I, 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 I'll just go into this one. <clears throat> People say, don't eat white foods. They say, eat colorful foods. Well, what is the ultimate in colors? It's white. White is the most colorful of all colors. What is the least colorful of, mm -hmm. of all? It's black. So when people say don't eat white foods, they're thinking white sugar. Okay, okay. Well, we talked about how white sugar rots teeth, et cetera. They're thinking, talking about white bread and white rice. Yeah, they're not ideal either. But how about cauliflower? You know, how about white potatoes? How about, I don't know, you can probably think of a half a dozen other white vegetables that are excellent for you to eat. White is the ultimate in color. If you're looking for color in food, eat white potatoes. Potatoes are the most phenomenal food that I'm aware of. Well, maybe sweet potatoes are a little bit better. But if I had a choice, I'd live on potatoes or sweet potatoes and water. Yeah, if you exactly. just gave me one food, it would be sweet potatoes and water or potatoes, white potatoes, white kind of potato, mm -hmm. purple potatoes. I don't care. Any kind of potato. Yeah, just give me a potato. Yeah. I'm a potato guy. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an Irish guy. Give me a potato. Give me a potato. Oh, yeah. No, me too. I, I must say, for people that don't maybe know a little bit of my stories, that I, I lost 70 pounds really eating potatoes and sweet yeah, well, potatoes. And thank you, Dr. McDougall. All right. Thank you. Thank you, folks. And uh, we will not be with them next Thursday. Is that right? So next Thursday, we're not having a webinar because in the United States, it's thing. And so our next webinar will be the first Thursday of December. Okay, good. Well, um, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Michael, again for being here. I want to add one uh, thing, Gustavo, uh, is Thanksgiving okay. is the healthiest. And we will see you next um, on December, the first Thursday of December. Yes, please. Can I, can I say one more thing? Yes. I want everybody to keep in mind, look at the picture. Thanksgiving is the biggest feast of the year, but it also happens to be the healthiest meal that most Americans eat. That is the lowest fat meat, it is full of uh, bread dressing, potatoes, vegetables, and that's the biggest feast of the year. And what happens after Thanksgiving is people go on to bigger feasts for breakfast. They go to Burger King for lunch, they go to Dairy Queen for dinner. I mean, <laughs> it's almost too much. Uh, anyway, uh, those of you that are going to have Thanksgiving, uh, Mary and I are going to be having a pumpkin, as she told you, uh, bread dressing, uh, various kinds of vegetables and potatoes, mashed potatoes, and it'll be a big hit for all our family, including um, we're going to have most of the grandkids here. Anyway, mm -hmm. I hope you have a nice oh, holiday, too. Well, we wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving thing. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Dr. McDougall, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yes, Gustavo, and thank you for another excellent coordinated presentation. Good job, all the way from London. Bye-bye. Okay. okay, bye. Bye. Um, let's see.